Hey, welcome back to the Black Mental Wellness Lounge. This is Brandon Johnson, and um, I'm really excited today. I have an, another guest on, and, and we're really going to get into um, something that's really been, you know, really important recently in this mental health space is, is around meditation and mindfulness and, you know, learning how to, you know, operate and navigate this wild and, you know, unpredictable space that we find ourselves in. Um, in 2020. And so with that, I want to uh, introduce my, my guest for the day. And this is Dr. Broderick Sawyer. And I'm so um, happy that you're here and happy that you're, you know, that you're with us today and that, you know, we'll be able to walk through this. But um, um, I want to throw it to you. Um, introduce yourself, tell us, introduce yourself to the lounge and tell us more um, about yourself and the work that you do. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, like you said, so Dr. Broderick Sawyer, um, but that still feels like an odd title. I think I do, uh, a few more oddball, non-traditional activities. Um, so, uh, I'm, I guess I classify myself as psychologist, therapist, uh, educator, uh, activist, author. Um, so currently I have a few projects over underway. Um, you can check out my website, brodericksawyer.com. So I'm doing some uh, consulting stuff. So diversity and inclusion work. Um, I'll lead mindfulness meditation workshops, um, race-based stress and trauma workshops. Uh, and that's really where my uh, expertise lies in terms of my um, clinical psychology background. Uh, so my training and dissertation, all that is on race-based stress and trauma. Uh, and the use of uh, mindfulness meditation and compassionate practices to overcome that. Um, I guess the last thing that I'll say about activities, um, so I, I'm sort of moving out of doing full-time therapy, um, but I do have uh, clients I see. Um, so I treat some race-based trauma, I treat some eating disorders, some trauma, some OCD, uh, some different stuff, but really I'm moving more so uh, into the workshopping, consulting, uh, educating type role. Um, and then uh, I feel even nervous, like talking about it, but, um, I could have, um, a book deal, um, you know, and, uh, pretty, pretty soon. So we're working on the proposal or the pitch, uh, and all of that for a self-help book, uh, for African-Americans, um, just working through race-based stress and trauma and living in an anti-black society. So hopefully that like fingers crossed. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me for now. Bro, I mean, so much <laughs> that you're that you're doing, and so much that that you're involved in. I mean, you know, definitely fingers crossed, prayers up for you for that book deal. I mean, that would be so impactful for our community to um, to really have that knowledge in, in dealing with this space, like because it is challenging, and we're unpacking it even more, like every day, like right now, like the culture is you know, we're pulling out and exposing and, you know, with that, it can be heavy. Like that's heavy in itself of, of you know, reliving and, and kind of working through um, this stuff. And so, you know, so many angles of, of your work that we could jump into. Um, you know, I really want to talk about, you know, your work with, um, you know, holistic health, right? Mm -hmm. Like looking at health holistically. Um, which, you know, I think can be really critical for us as, as Black people to explore and to be aware of and to engage in. And so, you know, in this space, like, how can we address um, our health from all angles while we're in this society, like, while we're battling this um, anti-Black society that we that we live in? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if, if folks have talked about it this way before, but to me, uh, awareness is holistic. Everyone has it. Uh, metacognition, our ability to observe ourselves, thinking about thinking, thinking about experiencing, really perceiving that feeling of right now I'm on a call with Brandon and I'm speaking and my hand is moving. See how that present moment, it's different. It slows things way down and we can directly perceive what's happening. So that awareness, that's where every piece of insight comes from. That's where every single action comes from. So sometimes people might ask me, well, what do I do when XYZ happens? You know, and they want that ready-made formula. 
uh, life is very, very uncertain. And when we're black in an anti-black society, there's a lot of uncertainty, but then also there's a lot of certainty when we pay attention. I love what James Baldwin says. He says, how can I trust what you say when I see what you do? I already saw it. You know, so if, you know, if I want a, a country built on racism to not be racist, what, what kind of, well, hold on a second. The answer was in the question, you right. know, so that really is where um, I look at uh, holistics is just awareness of what is. Um, and that's really influenced um, by um, my, I would say it's less spiritual background, more just philosophy background, which is mm -hmm. rooted in um, Buddhist psychology. And Buddhist psychology is just simply an as it is uh, attitude and perception of reality. So once I recognize that, and this is just my own, you know, story. This is right. no knock to anyone in academia, um, but for myself, I became aware of very intense just anger that my time was being taken. Um, if I wanted to go into the academic role, there was a lot of anger around that. There's a lot of resistance. There was a lot of, I felt as if I'd be inauthentic if I were to sit in these meetings being one of the only black people on mm -hmm. faculty. Roderick, what do you think about, you know, everything having to do diversity, even though we right. don't pay you for that, you know? <laughs> and I was a yeah. bit like, this is what it is. So, hey, Broderick, if you want to enter into the situation, you have to accept this. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. And I had to be honest with myself. I cannot accept this. What can I do? you know, to really help my community in a, in a way where I'm not code switching anything. And I had to create, you know, and that's, that comes with its own host of challenges too. You know, it's right. okay. Like this is what it is. It's uncertain. It's hard. So I'm sort of using awareness to navigate my, my world as it is not my expectations of how I think it is. Cause if I expect people to not be racist in a racist country, then they're racist, now I'm upset, and then the next time I'm upset, and the next time I'm upset, and the right. next time you stop personalizing things when you're armed with just the holistic nature of awareness, awareness, just shining light, you know, on things that are there that you can account for next time. You can essentially do the math. And I guess the last thing I'll say is um, we essentially want to audit our lives energetically. We mm -hmm. want to edit them based on energy. So if I'm paying attention, then I pay attention to how I feel when I interact with person X versus Y. If I feel bad, you know, when I'm hanging out with person X, what's what's going on in that situation? Let me enter right. to that situation again, even though I don't make you feel bad. What about it? You know, is it right. something that I'm, you know, is an expectation I'm having? Is it something that they're doing, whatever? And then we can start to sort of shift around, add and subtract different energies based on what I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also the nature of awareness. It increases. So as aware as I might seem, I'm still becoming aware of things as I continue to pay attention and, and make sense of things. Um, so then self-compassion, forgiveness becomes just more accessible because you know that you can't be aware of everything and neither right. can anybody else, you know. Man, that's that's so key. And it's something that you know, I, I talk about this in other episodes, but I work with kids, you know, like at, at my church, I have two kids. Um, but one of the things that we you know, I stress about a lot is having that aware awareness and mm -hmm. being mindful of, you know, what triggers certain emotions and, you know, who, when certain things come around, you know, processing, like, why? Like, there is a why. Like, you can explore, like, why, you know, this, you know, this does this. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's so critical, I think, for us to to say that to you. But you're, you're so right about you know, like your your commentary about this society, like we know what it is. And so being aware of it and, you know, maneuvering that, you know, we, um, you know, we have some unrealistic expectations and, you know, and it's because of wanting things to be a certain way and not taking, you know, um, a deep dive into what it is. But that's that's so critical. Um, what got you into into this work? Your, yeah. your, this work isn't easy. Like, I'm sure it's 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 tough and it's heavy. Um, you know, what, what got you into this work? Yeah. So I guess what would, cause it's two separate kind of answers. Cause at first it was, um, I was just, um, one of the people that got leaned on within my family structure and I can handle it and I could do it. And that was just my sort of, um, my call or in, in, uh, Buddhist psychology, my, my Dharma, you know, just what it is. Um, 
but I didn't really have an awareness of who I was because I was so busy just playing this role of helper. Um, so then that really just got me into that role and I was good at it and compassionate and wanting to, to help folks. Um, but then really when in terms of race-based stress and trauma, it was my dad watching him and the way he wouldn't accept uh, just mistreatment from the white power structure that he was in. He wouldn't accept it. And his attitude was, well, okay, like I'm just going to beat you. I'm going yeah. to be better than you. And yeah. that attitude, I think for our ancestors, you know, that's just what it was, you know, well, okay, you're not going to let me, well, I'm just going to have to, you know what I mean? Right. Go show right. you what it is, you know, and um, as a way of self-protection and, then as I um, and then as I developed and I then read um, for those who are out there who said, oh, yeah, I read Ma Malcolm X's autobiography when I was in fifth grade. Go back and read it again as an adult. Um, yeah. That like shifted my consciousness in such a sharp way. And it wasn't exactly it wasn't exactly who Malcolm X was. I can go off on 45 minutes about that. It was more that I saw reality in one way. And then the book went like that. And I was like, wait a second, reality can do that. Yeah. So then I was thinking like, well, why do I have to do this work in X, Y, Z sort of way? And then as I started to see the mental freedom, really what Malcolm was really talking about, thinking for yourself, defining yourself, determining, loving yourself, all that stuff. Um, then I started to move into different methods of freeing up that mind, freeing it up. Um, being able to see a thing and then sort of see all angles and be able to do that on command, which then allowed you to really make anything of anything, you know, really, right. really have an imagination. And when I work with uh, folks individually um, in therapy or when I'm doing a workshop or whatever it is, um, I want people to have that same ability, just like I found for myself to be able to turn that because when we, because life gets so hopeless when we look at these power structures and we say, okay, you are a worker and you should identify with your career 100% and you're not a person, you're a career, mm -hmm. right? I can wear a career mask. I right. can do my career and then, you know, set boundaries, like almost like uh, identity based boundaries, knowing where I end and other people begin. Um, right, similar right. to to white uh, ideologies, you know, I had to learn, especially through Malcolm, that this is what white society is telling you that you are. But you can play that game as much as you want, but know that you're not it, you know. So that I think right, that gives right. people this dialectic, and I'll try, I'm trying to break this apart in this book. Um, you can be in the world, but not of it, you know. Right. You can go home to a partner who validates the real you, you know, you go home to your kids who validate the real you. But if you have to, you know, talk to your boss, Keith, at some, at some job and Keith is, you know, microaggressing against you and all that stuff, you know, at the end of the day, number one, that doesn't define me. That defines his conditioning. And if right. I react to that and start to feel bad about myself, I'm feeling bad about myself because I'm half believing what he's saying. Right. right. But then further, I have a choice, you know, I have a choice if I want to continue to be at this job or not. If it's that agitating to me, how do I then make subtle shifts to sort of change that? Dynamic? So then I, again, it, it, you know, this work really started with a role mm -hmm. then it turned into me being like, oh, crap, I can turn people's minds to help them see. Then, then I started to do more of it with myself. And then right. my inner work became the work of everyone. And now I sort of want everyone to know that these things are possible. Um, and in particular, through um, a meditation practice combined with a sort of daily mindfulness practice of just trying to be aware of that moment to moment um, passing of time, really, at any given moment. Whew, man, <laughs> man, that we can unpack that for a couple hours. But that is, um, yeah, but that's, that's, that's so awesome that you were able to make that connection and then move it into trying to help others, you know, make those connections because um, it is heavy. And I think a lot of us, you know, unintentionally, you know, we do take some of it, you know, we do take <laughs> some of it in, um, you know, just because, um, you know, not intentionally, but mm -hmm. when you're in that society and you're fed these messages 
over and over again, you know, how do you navigate that some of it doesn't permeate through through your actions, through your thoughts, through, you know, how you engage with other people? Like it's right. it's so, you know, it's such a difficult thing for us to do when we've been doing it for so long. And, and so dope to hear about your dad too, man, and that that influence. And, and you're right, so many of our ancestors have, um, I mean, just done some amazing stuff in the face of, right. of intense situations and carrying that us carrying that forward while we're still having our own battles while different is is so critical to this one more question and then we'll jump into the mindfulness meditation but one more thing i wanted to to ask you about um so as we talk about when we're getting ready to go into this mindfulness mindfulness meditation what do you see as the benefit for black people to engage in mindfulness meditation or any type of meditation um where do you see the benefit specifically for us yeah, so I would say on two different levels, and we can use either level we feel comfortable with. So the first level is a more basic. The first level is safety, is learning how to feel safe on command because you practice feeling safe every day in your meditation, right? If you're a black person and you have and you come from the lineage of slavery, then you have generational trauma. Sorry, that's just what it is. Yeah, right? that's just that's just history, right? So to heal that, we need to learn what it feels like to feel safe. So, and we'll see in the practice, I'll do sort of two levels. There'll be that one level of safety. And then it's like, okay, here it is through the breath. Um, and it's just literally controlling um, the stress hormone cortisol response with the breath. So if you have a slower relationship with your breath and you breathe slower than you normally do, and if you just try to do that all day, every day, then you will feel more relaxed. You'll feel more patient. Um, you'll you'll respond rather than react. Reactivity, feeling sped up, racing thoughts, all of that stuff, that's just reflecting fear. If you have fast thoughts, then you're likely there's some fear in that body somewhere. Your thoughts are just reflections of your emotional states. So you, you can see this when you're happy, you have happy thoughts, you're sad, it's, it's very obvious. Right, right, right. Um, so then when we begin to just tune in and use and practice the breath, um, then we feel safe. So that's layer one. And then layer two um, is what I like to, when I teach uh, my mindfulness to um, predominantly black groups or activist groups, I, I talk about it as getting the white man out of your head, right? Getting right. him out. Because you can't believe what he believes. You know, you need right. to wake up and liberate your mind from all of that crap that you were right. taught and that you're still being taught to be able to yep. see it and not identify it like immediately. Um, so, uh, what we then do is we practice once we breathe and we see that first layer, now things slow down. So now our thoughts slow down a little bit. Now we can observe our thoughts and your thoughts are loaded with your conditioning. So your generational conditioning. Mm -hmm. So um, when we are black in America, right, our societal conditioning is forcing us to play into anti-blackness right? We have to, or we're punished in one way or another, you know, see Colin Kaepernick. Um, yeah. Yep. So then when we, uh, when we identify with that, we then feel bad. So what I'm saying is as a black person, identifying with American values is actually against self-love for yourself. Right. So we're socialized to not like ourselves, to feel inferior. And all of that's in the mind. The story you tell about yourself is not your story. It's society's story. Your parents, they, your caregivers, they get stories about themselves, who they get that from, their parents. That we go back 400 right. years, we were slaves. So we're operating off of these just self-limiting beliefs. And I, right. I talk about a lot, microaggressions can happen in two ways. You get microaggressed against or you do it to yourself. If you, you know, want to speak up and you don't, you know what I mean? Like yeah. anything can happen. Like, oh, but they'll say this or they say that or da 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 Well, right. You know, you're believing it. So you can't believe that, you know, yeah. so it's not about changing the outside world in this situation. This is about knowing where I end and white ideology begins, where white supremacy begins. So as we sit and we watch the mind, then we can let it pass, let it pass, let it pass. And we start to learn I am not my conditioning and my thoughts are conditioned. They're all projections based on my past experience. And then my past experience sees something like this cup and then knows like, oh, this is a cup. I grab it. I interact with this. So then right. when we as black people see a room full of white people and we have a certain expect expertise in a particular topic, 
our mind might see a group of white people don't say anything because you're you're not as smart as them. And right. this can happen so unconsciously right. because slavery was just happened for way longer than it hasn't. And that's just it. That's just numbers. And right. once we start to observe our minds, we start to observe these distortions and then we see them in real time. And then we start to be able to sort of have this extra layer of awareness that's not exactly watching Broderick do things. The awareness is watching Broderick happen. Because mm-hmm. if I didn't choose who I was born to, I didn't choose my conditioning. If I didn't right. choose my conditioning, I'm not choosing the situation I'm in, my mannerisms, any of that. It's just sort of momentum. It's just momentum. So then as I notice that Broderick is happening, I can forgive him more. Mm-hmm. I can see him as a flawed being and he feels insecure. He might shut down or he might get all cocky and stuff. And I'm observing and I'm like, this effing guy, man, right. he can't help himself, can he? You know, so it becomes right. a little bit more humorous because, you know, he can't help. He's trying his best. Right. Um, so then there's a, an ease that happens when you can see that your thoughts are just things controlling you quite unconsciously. And then you start to try to watch more and you have this patient curiosity about yourself. Um, And for black folks, I think first, again, getting that foot off our necks and being able to breathe and have that level of really just resilience against trauma. That's really Mm -hmm. what it's about. We're treating trauma What's the first thing you do. You're going to teach people coping skills to handle that high of emotion. Right. And then it's about those thoughts that reinforce the dynamic. If I keep acting inferior in front of white people or entering into situations and code switching or whatever, then I'm reinforcing these hierarchies. Sometimes I have to do those things. Sometimes I have to maybe, uh, for example, not drive at night across the country through the South. Like I'm not doing that. That's not a good idea. Um, In some realities, but in a lot of cases, we have a lot more freedom than we think we do. And I think that was really the core of Malcolm X's message, but you have to first analyze, self-insight, observe what behaviors am I doing to contribute to white supremacy and what behaviors am I doing to contribute to black liberation? And we want to move that needle in that opposite direction. But I think self-observation, it's just a very ingrained thing. You have 400 years of slavery. What do you expect to happen? You know, right. Man, listen, I brought you on for my audience, but this has been so helpful just for me. <laughs> 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 Like, man, this is, I'm going to be unpacking this for a while. Um, but man, so I, I want to, mm-hmm. without further ado, I want to, um, you know, let you do what you do with this mindfulness meditation right. and kind of walk us through um, a, a, a practice for us to do together. And so I'm going to turn it over to you and, and let you lead us. But thanks again. Of course, man. Word. So one more switch to my mic so I can hear myself well. So when we think about meditation, one of the first things we want to do is, like I said, starting with the breath, okay? So closing the eyes typically helps just center because we can get really distracted with different things in the room. And you really want to not do anything. That's the goal of meditation is his being. So we have to slow our bodies down. And what you're gonna notice is a little bit of resistance to that slowing down. So we want to recruit the breath. So what you're gonna do, start to take deep breaths into the lungs, but you want it to be very, very slow. A lot of people will try to go and really pull air in really quickly, but we want to relax the body, relax the fight, flight, freeze system. So we want slow and breath. So just like this, very all the way up. And then when you get to the top of the breath, you kind of want to let go. So, So it's letting go. It's not pushing. It's not forcing. It's just letting go. We're breathing all the way in again. Inflating the lungs as much air as you can take in and then just letting it all go. You want to let it go, knowing that all the air will come out by itself, like a balloon. 
So when you have a balloon, you're not pushing the air out to deflate it. You're just letting it go. And then all of the air comes out. It's a very important first step we're doing to create safety within ourselves. So continue to breathe this way. Just breathing all the way in. Just letting go. And then on the next out breath, what you're going to do is start to relax the shoulders. So breathing all the way in. And then when you let go of the breath, let go of the shoulders. Maybe even let go of any tension in the neck or the jaw. You can even sense any places in your body where you feel like you're holding yourself up so you can sink deeper into the chair. So we're trying to help our body through the breath do nothing. Slow it down all the way if we can. And we're not trying to force it to do that. We are encouraging safety. We're being supportive. We're sending the message to our body that we are safe in this moment. There's nothing to defend against. We're just here and we're breathing. And each out breath you lean into and you let go of, letting go of the shoulders, letting go of that control and sinking into the seat, sinking into your body, allowing gravity to hold you down. And even if you can sense that gravity is holding you down and allowing it a little bit more, a little bit more. And all you're doing is you're breathing all the way in and then all the way out. This is a very, very basic practice that I really created for therapy patients. And it has everything to do with controlling the stress hormone cortisol, which has everything to do with the breath. And then the breath creates feelings of safety. And then the mind feels a little safer. So now at this next stage, okay, so this is now stage two, we're going to observe the mind. Now, if it is your first time meditating or you start to try to look at the mind, but it's a little difficult or triggering in any way, you can just tune me out and go right back to focusing on only deep breaths, if that feels good to you. Um, and you can also, at any point in meditation, pull the parachute and you can just open your eyes and say, well, that was a little too intense, a little too long. Um, I'll try again next time, you know, in just a few minutes of meditation, you know, or even 30 seconds of meditation can help. So now at stage two, as we're settling into the breath, take a few more deeper breaths, settling in a little bit. And then we're going to start to notice what we're noticing. So you might notice the sound of my voice, different syllables. There's a certain cadence to them. You might notice the cadence of your breath. And you also notice background sounds, whether that sound is silence, any sounds in other rooms or outside. And if we think about our thoughts as sounds too, there are sounds right there. And we can observe all of these things happening. So everything is sensation. It's all neutral. It's a sensation. So there are some sounds that you like or that you don't like. And then there are certain sounds that you like in some situations and dislike in others. So we're just noticing everything happening at once. So sounds, breath. Notice that your body 
is in a chair. Maybe you can feel your feet on the floor. You can feel your hands or your arms. And you're just noticing from the perspective of the observer. And when we are in this observer awareness, we can see our thoughts a little clearer. And thoughts are a bit tricky, but not from this space. So now while we are thinking of our thoughts as sensations, I want you to look directly at your thoughts. I want you to let them run without accepting or rejecting any of them. So just let them move like they are just blood in the veins or just the sound. Look at your thoughts as if someone else is thinking them. Just try your hardest to sit back in this observing awareness and don't follow your thoughts. Don't follow. Just let go and allow them the freedom to move while you are sitting and watching, just like you're watching a movie. See if you can hold that space even for a few moments. Just notice the content. Notice the flavor or the tone of your thoughts. If it, for whatever reason, becomes hard to concentrate, you can go back to stage one. You can start to just focus on deepening the breath. You can always come back to focusing on thoughts. It's almost like you're watching a movie and you're trying to watch the movie without mistaking yourself for being in the movie. Just watching. And now your thoughts are sensations. They're not real in a classical sense. They're sensations. You can choose to buy into or not. One last step we can take, it's a bonus round, is we can, as we're watching our thoughts, I want you to ask yourself, who is watching these thoughts? Who's watching this? Even further, who is the one that's thinking the thoughts. And just taking a few more nice soft in breaths. It's very soft in, very soft out. And then when you're ready, you can slowly open the eyes, come back to the room. And this is um, essentially exploring your own consciousness. When you never look at what goes on under the hood in that way, because there I just took, took everyone pretty deep. Um, when you never look, you never find. So you could go your whole life believing the thought you know, I'm unworthy until you investigate it and ask who's thinking that. And you realize it's not you. You might realize you don't want to believe that. And with meditation, you realize that, you know, you don't have to with practice. Um, we don't have to be a reflection of our conditioning. Um, we can be a part of that uh, more creative consciousness where anything is really possible or any thought, any vision is, is possible if I only break out of what I think is possible. That's the freedom of the mind, but we need to 
start with interrogating it in one way or another. And meditation is just one way. Um, yeah, but I guess that that's all I, I got for now. Man, <clears throat> thank you so much for that. I mean, that was that was awesome. And I'm so excited to, you know, get this get this up for people to be able to share in this. I mean, I think there's so much um, that we can unpack in that in that space where we're it's just us and our thoughts and we can think through like what those thoughts are and that that last piece about you know who's thinking this and who's watching these thoughts is um is great and so um thank you so much for for sharing that and sharing your your wisdom today uh with us and um it's, it's definitely been um been a fantastic conversation um and so I want to uh, give you the opportunity to let people know how they can get in touch with you and um, how to connect with you if they're interested in in uh, learning. Birdman, more. yeah, um, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I love I love the initiative, man. I love how you created the space, and um, yeah, we really need it. Um, but yeah, as far as uh, getting in contact with me, um, I'm pretty active on Twitter. I mean, not the last few weeks, but Broderick A eighty eight. That was just my first name capital a 88 um where you just type in broderick so you'll probably find me um and also you can go to my website broderick um you can shoot me an email for different inquiries and whatnot um you know i, I do different uh, workshop presentations whether that's for universities or businesses or whatnot um nonprofit organizations so whatever um whatever kind of organization you have um even if it's just, you know, yourself and a couple other black people who are wondering, yo, what's this race-based stress and trauma thing? I need some help with that. You know, shoot me an inquiry. Um, yeah, we can see what's good. And I guess, uh, yeah, the last piece, um, check out um, my podcast. Um, I have a co-host with uh, Jesse Zook, man. We unpack all things mental health, society, um, all that good stuff. Um, that's on, uh, uh, it's on Spotify. It's on uh, iTunes. Um, we would have our, our little website, but it's I versus I. Um, you can even just type in my name, Broderick Sawyer, into Spotify or into iTunes and you'll find our stuff. Um, and then also I created a few uh, with the same co-host. We created a few free meditation workshops. So just how um, myself and Brandon just did, you know, um, my co-host Jesse, uh, we let him let a meditation and then just talked about it. Um, so if you, you know, if you enjoyed this episode, you'd likely like that. You know, those uh, pieces of free content as well. Um, yeah, but uh, I can send along those uh, links to you if that would be um, helpful. So maybe we can put them. Um, yeah, I'll tag them in the in the video. Make sure to put all that stuff down there so people can get connected to you. So we'll absolutely do that. Um, but sure. again, thank you so much for coming to the lounge. Dr. Broderick Sawyer, everybody. I appreciate your, your time and your energy and your work. Um, in this space and so thank you and I'm sure we'll be connected again soon of course man yes sir yes sir appreciate you man no problem thanks everyone for, for stopping through and